sections on climate change, climate and SDGs. Therefore, I would like to invite the moderator of the session, Bapak Nur Adi Wardoyo, to Bapak Nur Adi, the stage is yours. Good morning. Yes, buenos dias. Yes, see. Sí. Thank you for uh, joining us in this session, session number three of today in Indonesia Pavilion. And so this session is on the role of non-state actors for robust actions on climate and SDGs. So that uh, significant progress on ratification of the Paris Agreement by parties shows high commitment among the stakeholders, in including leaders from countries, uh, business, financial sector, civil society, and we are now working together for a climate action agenda. COP24, hosted by Poland, has put together the pieces, directions, and guidelines in order to make the framework operate on the ground, and we have the uh, part of the rule book for Paris Agreement. And now in COP25, hosted by Chile, that we continue our efforts to uh, complete the rule book and also that we need to show that yes, climate action is taking place and climate action works. And so here in this session, we have these uh, lessons learned from uh, non-state actors with representatives from uh, forest concessions and uh, energy industry in implementing the uh, climate agenda. And we have four speakers uh, for this session. First is uh, Mr. Dida Gardera of the uh, Coordinating Ministry of Economic Affairs of Indonesia. Please, Pak Dida, join us. Either side, take the chair. And we'd like to uh, recognize and invite Professor Thomas CLC, yeah, from uh, Warsaw University of Technology, Poland. I'd like to recognize and invite uh, Mr. Rahmat Safrudin, Vice President for Production of PT Badak NGL, and fourth speaker, Mr. Sihol Aritonang, General Director of RAPP. Uh, pulp and paper industry in Indonesia. Welcome, sir. Please join us. And so we have uh, this session until 12.15. And so I would like to uh, give 10 minutes for each of the speaker, and then we will have some discussion or question and answer. So I would like to invite the first speaker on the podium. Mr. Dida Gardera of the uh, Coordinating Ministry of Economic Affairs of the Government of Indonesia. Pak Dida, you have the floor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for having me uh, here discussing the importance of the role of the private sectors in uh, climate change uh, mitigation and also in adaptation. There are many uh, government policy to, to develop the conducive uh, uh, situation, the conducive policy for embracing all the uh, private sectors. Uh, these figures show that Indonesian economy has in the position good enough, so the, there is a room for the for maneuver for the climate change exercise uh, uh, in pro climate investment, uh, all the things related to reduce uh, greenhouse gases emission, uh, shown that uh, our economic, economic growth. Uh, above five percent, and the uh, poverty and also the inequality has been uh, reduced. The gap. 
Yeah, uh, we have uh, our NDC, uh, 29% by uh, 2030, as from the business as usual. Uh, the government of Indonesia recognized that we cannot fulfill alone to meet our uh, targets, so we have to embrace all stakeholders, particularly the private sectors. Uh, among others, our policy in this uh, event, I want to talk, uh, there is uh, two newly uh, policy development. First, we are now uh, in work working on the carbon pricing mechanism to implement Indonesia. And secondly, we just established uh, our uh, environmental fund early October. Uh, Minister, coordinating Ministry of Economic Affairs, Minister of Environment and Forestry, and also Minister of uh, Finance has uh, announced the establishment of this uh, agency. First, about, uh, as we know that there is at least three sources of funds. First, uh, government budget, at national or local government. Second, from the, our international partner, whether it's bilateral or multilateral. And last one is from public, uh, private sectors. They, ha they have their own uh, uh, financing mechanism. Uh, and then related to the uh, carbon uh, emission reduction, we have experience in CDM, uh, VCS, and also still ongoing, the joint community joint crediting mechanism, all the three source cannot fulfill our demand, our needs to meet our target. So that's why we need one vehicle that can answer the gap uh, 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 or the problem that, uh, about financing climate uh, change. So that's why the government of Indonesia want to build the new vehicle called uh, Environmental Fund, or in Indonesia, BPDLH, Badan Pengelola Dana Lingkungan Hidup. Uh, for carbon market, we have experienced uh, many platform, one of them through the market uh, partnership for market readiness, uh, World Bank program, uh, result already some uh, 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 activities, First, about the emission profile, profiles, particularly in the power and in the several industry sectors. Uh, also, we have already MRV system already put in place uh, in the power sectors, in the uh, cement industry, uh, fertilizer industry. Now, we are working, hopefully, by the mid of next year, uh, we can establish the mechanism and also the regulation, if we need the new regulation for doing that, uh, there will, we will develop two kind of carbon market. First, domestic carbon market. This is fully to support our NDC. And then now we starting to uh, engage also to exercise Article 6 while we still waiting the decision in this scope or perhaps the next scope. But uh, we preparing the, all the modalities. Uh, second, as I mentioned that we are uh, preparing the modern vehicle, we can say some like that. Hopefully this, uh, this body can fulfill all the, uh, the gap uh, that uh, we face right now. The strategic of this uh, BPDLH, first, uh, we will impose all the principle of sustainable development, change uh, principle, uh, either mitigation and adaptation, and also in the governance. It's kind of uh, innovation for financing, and also it, it can also uh, can attract all the potential international uh, fund including the pledge of all the countries in Paris Agreement, about 100 billion US dollar per year, starting hopefully next year. 
last one, yeah, uh, if we already establish and uh, have the uh, body uh, standard in, in, in international standard, so we'll attract all the possible uh, potential of fund. This is the structures. This uh, agency consists 10 minister, ministries, according ministry, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Environment and Forestry, until the sectoral uh, ministry. Uh, this the picture uh, show that all kind of possible channeling the fund uh, we will develop uh, the viability gap fund, the carbon uh, market mechanism, uh, the, this vehicle also can guarantee uh, to the investment some, uh, and the beneficiary will be uh, uh, be, be designed for all the, the stakeholders. The activities could be like this, the energy efficiency, conservation, adaptation, forest conservation, transportation, and so forth. And so forth. We already exercised this sector for green sukuk, green uh, Islamic bond. Uh, last, uh, close my final remarks. Uh, perhaps this uh, morning, uh, my colleague from Bapenas already shared about the low carbon development. Uh, we are already have a, a core technical readiness for uh, market carbon market, including the RV system. Uh, all the industry private sector that we are already engaged, shown then their willingness to involve in this uh, scheme. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we're still uh, developing our regulation, the framework. Uh, first, in the first years, uh, the Environmental Fund Agency, BPDLH, will focus uh, into two aspects. One, for implementing the uh, reforestation fund or reboisation fund, and also hopefully the RED fund, uh, Norwegian, from Norwegian, will be dispersed uh, next year. And the second one, we develop the new windows, particularly for energy. Uh, carbon pricing still ongoing. Hopefully, the end, at least the end of this next year will be finalized. If we rely on our regulation, the deadline is 2024, but our uh, higher policy makers uh, has agreed to accelerate the process and yeah uh, my office particularly right now uh, have many uh, initiative uh, directly uh, instruction from the our president uh, to develop conducive policies for all the investment we are now uh, making the what we call the omnibus uh, law and also, uh, license also, and also licensing reform through online single submissions. Hopefully, with all this policy, can attract uh, much more uh, engagement of the prefector. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Pak Dida. So uh, the government of Indonesia uh, gives the very positive signals for the private sectors to uh, jump into this uh, endeavor on the climate challenge. And so I'd like to invite now the uh, second speaker, Professor Thomas Zygielski of the uh, Warsaw University of Technology, Poland. You have the floor, sir. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for invitation and I'm happy to be here sharing with you some thoughts about the climate support via strategy towards zero mineral waste with circular economy symbiosis. The <clears throat> when we observe the needs of the society globally, we see that domestic extraction of the world increased 
tremendously. Mostly the uh, mineral ores, fossil fuels, non-metallic ores, and biomass increase. Among the most, the quickest growth is uh, non-metallic minerals. The aggregates mostly we need for the construction sector. When we see the future, the needs on these fields is growing dramatically. In mass, we will reach level of 180 billion tons a year. That would generate significant value counted in trillions of uh, euro and a lot of emission. That's the future. When we see how it's distributed between different kinds of resources, the biggest one is, of course, minerals, ores, fossil fuels, and biomass. And what is the result of this? The result is that netto to the stock means we really use only 21 billion out of 84. We waste directly 19.4 billion tons and disperse through different kinds of emission nearly 52 billion. Only 9% return <coughs> in circularity. Again, extraction, usage, disposal, and only 9% circulate. Means for the future, for our children and grandchildren, we will leave a big stockpiles. And this is bad news. Circular economy in Europe, we're trying to uh, apply. Also in Asia, you are trying also your best. In Indonesia, I have heard, I've been last year on such a workshop, is growing. Environment and economy to go together. For this, we need to create new strategies. One of the biggest strategy is value depreciation, means preserve and extend what is already made. Second strategy, use waste as a resources. But, but most favorable strategy, in fact, is to rethink of business models, to find new approach. When we see reality of energy production globally, the conclusion is very clear. Wind is growing, uh, solar growing, but coal still remain. And it doesn't matter what European Union wish, doesn't matter what BIDs will sell, say, doesn't matter. This is the reality. And in this reality, we will live. And it's not the question, uh, uh, <clears throat> no other question than provide electricity for the, for the society. And because of this, the result of this, of the coal in the energy mix is different kinds of anthropogenic minerals. Ply ash, bottom ash, FDG gypsum. Circular economy strategy say, first of all, prevention. Not reusage, not recycling, not recovery. Prevention, not to produce waste. What happened when we apply this strategy? It means products. Instead of waste, from the beginning, we should apply the strategy of products. Means what? Products means fulfilling the technical requirements for the product. In Europe, we have our standardization organization, which are the part of international standardization and national. In this case, all achievement in Europe is ready to use for you through the international recognition or directly through the national recognition. What kind of standards we are talking about? Mostly in terms of minerals coming from the sector. Cementation standard, ply for concrete, hydraulic road binders, aggregates for concrete, lightweight aggregates, fillers to asphalt. They are product standard and application standard. In Europe, we practice this last 50 years. We have also our 
testing standards and our declaration for the product, which include all aspects, mechanical, safety, hygienic, energy, economy, and sustainable use. We have also tested in a rich system environmental influence of this kind of product. In case of the coal ashes, to minimize negative influence of coal into the nature, we tested physical chemical properties, toxicology, ecotoxicology in different kind of ashes. Symbiosis. This is the key. What kind of symbiosis? Symbiosis between the industry and energy production sector. In Poland, we made new systematic, systematic of, of anthropogenic resources, uh, not, not only based on the virgin resources, but also anthropogenic resources. And for this reason, we can find deposit everything what is on hips, stockpile, and the streams from the current production. We can define anthropogenic resources as a deposit streams, and based on this, we can make a product, aggregates, binder, filler. In terms of the energy sector itself, we apply already in Poland innovative approach, improve the qualities of the ashes inside the power plants, not waiting for the random qualities out of power plants, just to take care of the preparing the fuel on the combustion process, improving physical qualities in the discharge phase, separation and different kind of admixture. Finally, how to do on the national level? This is roadmap for circular economy. This is the consensus between the sectors and the government. In our roadmap, we have the two priorities. The first two priorities is about analysis of the potential and proposal of changing legislation to increase the use of coal combustion products and zero waste approach. We would like to have energy sector still in Poland based on coal combustion, but without solid waste. We still fight with the emissions, but we can run without stockpiling any ashes, any gypsum. We have clear examples. The Tefra project would demonstrate that using these binders based on the coal ash, we can save the climate. Which way? We deliver to the infrastructure market much uh, lower emission binders instead of 800 CO2 or 700 lime or cement, only 120 kilograms. This is directly avoided emission. In terms of Indonesia, you have very ambitious plans for infrastructure. This is from your governmental side, uh, road construction till uh, uh, 2024, nearly 5,000 new kilometers of road. This is impressive. And this kind of projects will consume a lot of virgin aggregate, a lot of binders, and instead of virgin one, you can use all your ashes coming from the power plants or originated in the power plants based on coal combustion. Finally, it's easy to compare the, the traditional method in terms of cement use, emission and cost with the proposed methodology means anthropogenic binders, uh, CO2 savings, and also financial savings. Not only for road construction, but also for cubature construction, general construction, also for railway construction, reclamation, uh, different kind of geotechnical uses, this kind of product could be implemented. Warsaw University of Technology is open for cooperation. We have more than 30 years experience with this. And this is the case of the cooperation between the private sector and the state uh, uh, as a part of, uh, of cooperation also. Circular economy is, is economy. In this case, the country, the state is unavoidable. Some regulation need to happen to support this kind of process. Symbiotic approach is critical. And we know how to do it. 
Secondary first. This is our motto. This is our slogan. First, we should use secondary minerals before we take the virgin ones. For future generation, we need to save the virgin one. And for the current project, if there is experience, if there is health, if there is fund, we in Poland definitely recommend this kind of way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sikielski. So uh, we heard from the university that we have some uh, technology help science now provide this approach of circular economy. Uh, more technology will come to the business for use and so that we work together. And we'd like to get the information that there is now a technical committee in ISO, uh, technical committee 323, three, yeah? on circular economy just established early this year. And Indonesia plans to join this uh, technical committee. I'm director of standards at the Ministry of Environment Forestry, so I know this. Thank you so much for bringing this information. And so now I'd like to invite the third speaker, uh, Bapak Rahmat Safrudin, Vice President of In Production of PT Badak NGL Indonesia. Bapak Rahmat, you have the floor. Good morning. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, at this opportunity, I would like to uh, share the leadership and uh, sharing best practice as strategy of developing uh, shared commitment and its implementation for uh, climate action. Uh, this is the agenda. I will uh, introduce the company and then uh, the corporate climate action uh, and then followed by climate action with community leadership and sharing best practice. Uh, our company, PT by the NGL, uh, is running energy business. We are producing energy, one of the uh, clean energy. The company was established uh, back in 1972 and started produ production in 1977. So we are in uh, in the business for uh, more than uh, 40 years. Uh, our peak production uh, was reached in 2001 when we uh, produced 22.5 million tons per annum of LNG. Uh, but now, due to uh, gas declining, uh, the supply to our plant, we only produce 8.4 million tons per annum of uh, LNG. The total area is around uh, 2,000 2, hectares. 56% uh, uh, is the uh, green area. So, uh, out of 50% of the green area, uh, 87 hectares is uh, conservation forest, where we conserve uh, the forest in its original form. This conservation area now become uh, the uh, home for some uh, endangered animals like orangutan, wah -wa, and some of the uh, uh, long-nosed uh, monkey, uh, bekantan. We also have uh, a forestation area, uh, 43 hectares, uh, from the uh, former uh, area of uh, temporary housing. Uh, now we move uh, uh, the people to permanent housing to other location and then the temporary housing uh, was demolished and we uh, plant trees uh, to uh, make it forest again. In addition, we also have uh, a forestation area of 9.1 hectares in uh, mangrove area. This area was formerly uh, uh, a location where we put the uh, dredging material from a dredging process. We also have a, a tissue culture lab where we uh, successfully uh, 
growing tissues from some endangered orchids and uh, nephantes. Uh, uh, and we are working now toward uh, producing uh, or growing plants from hard trees, hard work trees. Because hard work trees is difficult to, to grow in from uh, the uh, uh, tissue. From production process, uh, here, are, here are some of the non-voted uh, innovation and actions uh, being done to support the climate actions. We, uh, these are some of the uh, several uh, innovations we have done so far. Uh, uh, this is uh, the selected one. I will explain uh, some of this. Uh, from uh, dual heating value, uh, since we uh, receive new gas from uh, the, the, the field uh, that is not uh, actually uh, properly uh, designed for our plant. Uh, we are suffering of uh, having uh, lower LNG, lower heating value of LNG. In order to uh, boost the heating value, we spike LPG into the LNG, so we consume uh, LPG to maintain the heating value of the LNG uh, at the original spec. <coughs> uh, looking at uh, the, the cost uh, uh, using of L LPG uh, for spiking to LNG, uh, we are in put effort to split uh, the uh, production into two product streams. Uh, uh, the the existing one, we call it rich LNG. Uh, it's not that we getting value by uh, keeping the LPG reaction. Uh, for the rest, the rest of the product, we call it lean LNG. Uh, we don't need to uh, spec LPG uh, into the product stream. Uh, from this uh, efforts, we uh, reduce the LPG consumption up to 360,000 uh, cubic meters per year. From long history of uh, operation experience, we also have uh, made a uh, lot of uh, uh, innovations and, and uh, modifications to our startup and uh, shutdown process of the LNG trains. Uh, in order to reduce the emission during the startup and shutdown process, also to uh, keep the uh, gas uh, in the product stream instead of uh, flaring. In terms of uh, alternative LNG, by the LNG in cooperation with uh, Pertamina already installed up to four megawatts of uh, solar cell, PV solar cell, and also we also already installed 340 uh, kilowatts of uh, solar cell on rooftop. Uh, this uh, will uh, reduce our uh, fuel consumption uh, in uh, generating uh, power. In 2009, there are 95 improvement programs, uh, 21 are of it uh, are related to uh, environment uh, innovation. We so far have uh, 14 uh, patents uh, for environment, and environment related uh, up to 2019 so far. Uh, in terms of uh, climate action with community development, uh, engaging local people is very important uh, to uh, make local people uh, care about their environment. Uh, one of the effort is uh, to have uh, uh, to to promote uh, the promotion uh, on the uh, surrounding area. So we empower. Uh, local people uh, to get involved in this uh, uh, initiatives by having uh, by, by engaging local people, uh, they switch or they change uh, the behavior from uh, previously uh, destructive fishing into uh, protective uh, the environment because they feel that they need to maintain like the coral reef uh, for the tourism as well as uh, to keep uh, 
the, the fish uh, from breeding. From breeding. Uh, Selangor City, one of the example where we uh, uh, involve uh, local community on the uh, ocean. Uh, these are local people uh, surrounded by waters. Yeah, they are not connected by land uh, to the shore. Uh, so this one, uh, this is one of the, uh, the location that we, we put uh, our community development program uh, for the uh, tourism. Uh, so the people now change the behavior from uh, previously. They don't care uh, about the uh, they throw trash uh, to the ocean now. They keep the, the ocean clean by uh, keeping uh, the trash in, in their uh, home and uh, treat it uh, properly as well as the uh, community uh, toilet. We also uh, have uh, foster groups for mangrove nursery uh, to support mangrove area afforestation and uh, reforestation. See uh, this another example of uh, tourism initiative where we uh, empower young people uh, in the local area to uh, promote the uh, tourism on the uh, mangrove area. But before, uh, this mangrove area has no uh, economical value. By having a uh, tourism uh, initiative, uh, the local community take the benefit, take the benefit from having additional income from this uh, initiative as well as uh, keeping the environment uh, in a good condition. Leadership is the key uh, role uh, in making all this happen. Uh, the role of the management uh, in addition to uh, giving uh, direction and resources for all these efforts also uh, conduct the uh, control and inspections to uh, all the uh, empowered uh, group. Instead of having a routine uh, inspection, we make it uh, like a fun activities. So uh, the management uh, will involve in a uh, fun bike to visit the empowered group. Uh, and and we, we also have uh, like other uh, social activities. So the management will not feel this is routine duty, but they feel this is a fun activities to meet uh, the empowered group. The management also uh, have uh, walked through to the plan to, to meet directly to uh, the workers, to the people who, who do the, the job in the field, so they can get uh, direct feedback from uh, the people how we manage the safety, health, employment, and quality. Uh, one of the initiatives uh, to keep uh, the safety level in a peak performance is we uh, give reward to contractor employee uh, according to their uh, safety performance at the end of the contract. This is important because uh, by having any incentives to the workers, uh, they, uh, they engage in uh, keeping their safety performance in, in the best uh, condition. Last, uh, as uh, our environment management and community development been appreciated uh, and awarded uh, in a high level by uh, uh, the Minister of Environment and Forestry uh, in the proper program. We are very happy to share our uh, reliable safety management system to other companies. We have uh, shared to more than 100 companies so far. We, we have hosted uh, benchmarking and uh, sharing knowledge to uh, many companies worldwide not only uh, domestic, but also international companies uh, on reliable security system and uh, the proper compliance uh, practice. Uh, 
uh, we have been uh, the resource person in many uh, discussion forums and conferences, and we also uh, become the partner from uh, DNVGL in developing their uh, ISRS uh, ninth series. Uh, so the ninth series of ISRS will involve uh, community development. Previous uh, version uh, does not involve uh, the uh, community development. Uh, these are the uh, the our, our clients uh, so far uh, that we uh, have shared our experience. We also have become uh, the center of excellence for the uh, uh, SheQ performance uh, management, and we have uh, assisted many companies in uh, commissioning and startup of their plan, such as in Sunafit uh, LNG. Uh, uh, now we assisted the uh, commission startup of uh, two LNG plants in the United States, Cameron LNG and Freeport LNG. That's uh, proof uh, that our CQ uh, performance has uh, been appreciated by many parties. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next speaker, I'd like to invite uh, Sihol Aritona. General Director of RAPP, uh, Pulp and Paper Industry in Indonesia. Good morning. Yeah. For those who attended to me last Monday, uh, let me briefly introduce April. We manage around 1 million hectare of uh, land under permit from the government of Indonesia. We plant trees, acacia and eucalyptus. We manufacture products that we use in our daily lives. Photocopy paper, printing paper, uh, packaging, tissues, yeah. And in managing the business, the operations, we are guided by sustainable forest management policy, yeah, which we launched four years ago in COP21. Yeah. And this sustainable forest management policy guides us in ensuring that our production process remains sustainable. Now, Sustainability is getting more and more incorporated in, into our operations, and that is why uh, we embrace, we welcome the advent of sustainable development goals in 2015. Now, we all know there are 17 goals under SDGs, 269 targets, and 400 over indicators. Like many business decisions, we want to have focus. By fo having focus, we will be able to achieve clear targets, clear outputs. Yeah. Uh, to do that, two years ago, we conducted an in-depth assessment of our social and economic contribution through our production. And in doing so, we partner with UNDP and with PricewaterhouseCoopers. Through a rigorous analysis by comparing national statistics, world statistics, regional statistics, and also comparing with what are other companies doing, our peers in the natural resource management industry, in the world, what are they doing? Based on this rigorous process, we were able to identify our priority goals. There are seven of them. Three are core, meaning they are part of our business, they're directly linked with our business. And four are goals where we can do catalytic Role. Now, as a major employer in Riau province of Indonesia, we really want to contribute concretely to the betterment of lives of the community in Riau and in the neighboring provinces as well. Okay. Now, one of the problems in Indonesia is employment. And at the root of the employment pro unemploy unemployment problem is a gap between what education produces 
in terms of the skills and competencies and what the industry needs. So there is a gap between the, quality, the competency built by education and the needs of the industry. So to address that, we take part in the government-led program to revitalize vocational educations. Let me give you an example. In a secondary vocational education in Indonesia, for instance, there is a, a school about, there is an education about automotive industry. Yeah. But that automotive industry doesn't respond to the business need in, within the province. Province of Riau is characterized by use of many heavy equipment. Now the students are being taught how to repair and maintain passenger cars, passenger vehicles. Yeah. There is a gap between what the company needs are people who have the skill to operate and maintain heavy equipment. So what we did is that we adopted a number of uh, vocational education. We improved the curriculum. In fact, we also developed new curriculum to make sure that the graduates will have a likely a better chance to be employed by companies like APRA. Okay. In addition to that, I, I mentioned, I gave an example about uh, high school education. Yeah? We also, uh, last year we also launched a uh, collaboration with University of Riau to do, to develop the first in Indonesia in terms of the three-year college uh, in pulp and paper. Now, with this, we also improve the competency of uh, the youth in Indonesia. The employability will be improved. Yeah? And by doing this, we address two things at the same time. Social needs in terms of addressing unemployment and the business needs in terms of building enough talent pools from the local area. Now, embracing SDGs is a nice thing to do, but of course, as many business decisions, we want to be able to measure our contribution. Yeah? Uh, this slide shows yeah, how our activities from the left side here will lead to the achievement of specific SDG targets. We need to be able to do this, yeah? because if you are not able to, to measure and document our progress and our achievement during the board meeting discussing our budget every year the board members will challenge the validity of our vocational education program as a business activity so it's very important that we are able to lay out the link between inputs outputs outcomes and then also the sdg impacts eventually now, only with this, only with having clarity in terms of the, what we call impact pathway, we will be able to convince the board to continue supporting this vocational education. Yeah. And the beauty of this vocational education program is that it addresses social needs at the same time that it addresses business needs. Now, another example where a true, a core business activity can contribute to SDGs is our ecosystem restoration in Riau. We have been trusted by the government of Indonesia, the Ministry of Forest, uh, Environment and Forestry, to manage around 150,000 hectares of land as a conservation area. Yeah, it's called Restorasi Ecosystem Riau. We have uh, been granted a 60-year uh, license. And for us, this is a good part of, of this will contribute, uh, con this will con uh, contribute uh, significantly to our one-to-one -one commitment, where we commit, and this is part of our sustainable forest management policy launched in 2015, that for every hectare of land that we manage as industrial forests, we commit to manage one hectare for restoration and conservation functions. Yeah. And as of last year, 2018, uh, we are in at 83% of meeting our one-to-one -one, uh, commitment. And we are uh, fortunate that our board supports this Restoracy Ecosystem Riau uh, with $100 million of funding that will carry 
the initiative uh, for the next 10 years. Partnership with community is key. Yeah? We believe that community around the conservation area should also benefit economically from the conservation area. Yeah? But of course, uh, there, ha there are parameters that we need to agree with the community so that the conservation effort, the restoration effort will become, con uh, will become sustainable and at the same time benefiting the surrounding community. Biodiversity, this is another, of course, this is another SDG goals, yeah. It's also another beneficiary of, of our Restorasi Ecosystem Riau, yeah. Together with uh, Fauna and Flora International, 2015, and then subsequently we conducted assessment in-house annually, we have been able to identify 759 species living in the area of 150,000 hectare conservation that we manage. Yeah, and we will continue to do this assessment to identify uh, many more uh, endangered species and new species uh, within our conservation area. What is next after this conservation is that we want to build knowledge about peatland management, about forest management, about high conservation value, and for that, Within the conservation area of 150,000 hectares, we are building what we call now as Eco Research Camp. The progress has been very promising, and we are looking at starting to have this launch in second quarter of 2020. Now, we will be inviting researchers from all over the world to do research on peatland management and forest management in our Eco Research Camp in Riau. By doing the research in our facility, they will not only have uh, first-hand uh, exposure to uh, peatland and also to natural forests, but also they will have, the researchers will be able to see first-hand also how the production protection model will work. Yeah. Uh, in April, we believe in production protection model, meaning to say if we have a conservation area and we're leaving the conservation area as an open access area that is accessible by whoever within the, uh, within the uh, conservation area, then it will be difficult to maintain the effectiveness of the conservation. Now, in our model, as much as possible, the conservation area, the restoration area, would be surrounded by our production area where we'll be planting acacia, we'll be planting euc eucalyptus, and the commercial aspect, the commercial activity, will be able to afford the patrol and also the fire protection. So that is what we believe. Now, with this equal research camp, we want to help the advancements of forest knowledge specific to Indonesia. With this eco research camp, we want to take part in building positive narrative about forest management in Indonesia. And of course, in doing so, we want to have the eco research camp as green as possible. Okay? By having, you know, uh, and, and renewable, renewable energy sources, optimize production of clean water, minimize water consumption, pollution, and solid waste. Now, for this activity also, again, uh, our board would require that we are able to lay out the link between all these $100 million investment to the SDGs. We need to be able to present this to our board so that they will continue to support these initiatives. Yeah? Now, we need to be able to link from the inputs that we do, what output, what clear output that will be producing every year, what outcomes that we will be producing from now until the year 2030, which is kind of like the deadline of SDGs, and the impact in terms of achieving the specific targets of uh, sustainable development goals. So we would, as much as possible, would like to stay, well, I repeat, we would like to not stay at the goal level, but we want to go deeper to targets level and indicator levels of sustainable development goals. 
Now, to conclude my remarks, again, in April, we believe that private sector can absolutely take part in achieving sustainable development goals. And achieving the sustainable development goals can be through projects, as in community development or corporate social responsibility, but a much greater impact will be achieved if sustainable development goals, sustainable development targets, and the indicators are truly incorporated in the core business. And our operations, our SDG strategy is not yet perfect, but uh, we call on our other stakeholders, our peers, to collaborate so that together we can achieve more positive stories about forest management in Indonesia and at the same time contribute to achieving sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pasiho. Now we come to the uh, discussion, dialogue, question and answer because this uh, pavilion is meant as the dialogue forum, yeah? And so I'd like to open this uh, dialogue, question and answer. If you have some from the audience would like to, uh, yes? One? Anyone to take two? No? We'll, we'll start with one, yeah? Okay, microphone please. To the lady in red. Who's coming with the microphone? Mas? Yeah. Hi, I'm just wondering about uh, the last... Kindly introduce yourself. Yeah, to hi, the my name is Aminda. I'm a student representative with the American Chemical Society. And I think the vocational training that you were talking about is really important. And I'm wondering what kinds of training um, in industry situ or what kinds of trainings are available to students and how you were successfully able to put that into schools. Great, yes, okay. And okay, we have the second uh, audience to. Hello, good morning. I am Helen morning. Magata, I'm from the Philippines. And I really appreciate all the presentations, especially the last one. Uh, I, I have a question about how indigenous peoples and local communities are engaged in the process of the private sector, especially in the setting up of uh, eco, eco uh, camps. Yes, okay. We will take uh, these two uh, contributions of uh, intervention. So we'd like to invite uh, our business leaders, uh, speakers. Yeah? But so, would you like to address that? Please. Uh, my apology, I didn't get your name, but I get the questions, okay? So you were asking about, you know, how we identify, I mean, how we manage or design our vocational, educa vocational education program. We started with the business needs, you know, you know, it's always the business needs. If it starts with the philanthropic or charity needs, it, may be, it will be difficult to sell it to our board, okay? We start with the business needs, and we recognize that our business needs talent pool, strong talent pool at all levels. Yeah? So we identify in the next 25 years, what are the skills that we need? Now at the crux or at the heart of our business is the plantation management. And plantation management means use of, among others, use a lot of heavy equipment. Yeah? And then we look at internally, what's the profile of our current employees, current workforce that manage the plantation. Yeah. It turned out that not many of them came from uh, the linear uh, education background. Yeah. Some are from general education and then they, you know, by through time, they become experts in managing our heavy equipment, for instance. Yeah. So, well, we, and then we, based on that, we concluded that we, there is a gap between what the local schools are producing in terms of competency and what we need. We can, of course, always, quote, unquote, import our manpower from other provinces, but then the growth that we achieve will not be an inclusive growth. We want to grow with the community. So we embark on a design of our vocational education where uh, we 
decided to tweak some of the existing curriculum of the local schools and then introduce new courses so that the, 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 the graduates of the school will also have uh, matching competency with what we need. But a lot of the problems in ed vocational education in Indonesia is actually lack of exposure to the industry. Okay? So in theory, 60% of vocational education should be in the field. Now that has been absent in the system. So what April does is to help bridge, uh, fill in that gap by providing exposure to our industry. Not only for the students, don't be surprised, a lot of the teachers also in vocational education don't get to see how uh, field operations actually are in play. So that's, yeah, that's, that's my answer. Uh, and secondly, on question by Ms. Helen, the community, okay, in, within the conservation area. For many generations, this community have, for instance, have been living, uh, they have, been, have been making li a, li a living by fishery. Okay. Now, there's no way we can divert them into other type of livelihood in a short, short one. Yes. So, then our decision is that to what to allow or in fact to support the fishery activities, but at the same time we agree with the communities how they can conduct fisheries business sustainably. Okay. Another one uh, livelihood that normally the community does is that they harvest honey, honey from the bees, right? So when they harvest honey and you know, to get rid of the, the bees for a while, they maybe they burn, they, they, they produce some smokes by one way or another. Yeah. Now that one also we have to manage. Yeah. And we devise or we design training that would allow honey harvesting in a more sustainable and less hazardous for in terms of fire. So yeah, uh, so that is the kind of uh, examples on how we engage the community. And of course, uh, at the center of our restoration ecosystem is the forest rangers. The local community members get to become the forest rangers through professional training. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. So that uh, we had those, uh, uh, what you call, uh, management class uh, that uh, on the human resources, we usually talked about uh, retaining the best talents. And yeah, getting the best talents, retaining the best talents. Now we talk about no one left behind. And so that the uh, management classes in those uh, business schools need also to get some uh, revamp. Yeah? But we see that the business leaders uh, respond to this uh, challenge of sustainable development and provide you with this uh, answer and uh, response. And so we'd like to invite the Papa uh, Ramachuga from the business leader. How is your perspective in this uh, of the question? Yeah, for, for the second question that uh, how we engage uh, local people, uh, it is important uh, to know that all the program will not succe succeed unless we have a, a pioneer or local hero. This is very important. Uh, we cannot put the program to people and uh, they will do the program, no. So we need to have local people that they, that they can uh, move the people, they can uh, uh, bring the people to, to, to work together with, with him uh, to achieve the same goal. Uh, the forum uh, where we uh, discuss uh, the initiatives, uh, we can conduct a, a, a discussion forum uh, between co company, uh, private sector with the local community, as well as with uh, local government. So we can uh, uh, put the map of uh, uh, each uh, area that they, they will not overlap between each other. So uh, each area will have uh, their own program and their local hero. So we, the, the, the private se sector only provide resources and uh, training, how we uh, empower them, how we build their capacity uh, from uh, uh, the local people to become uh, let's say, a uh, uh, world-class uh, uh, hero. So they know how to, uh, uh, to manage the, uh, what they, they have done, the initiative, how, we, the, how they market, uh, for example, the products. Uh, we assist them in uh, giving the training. So uh, the people now uh, 
how how they they can uh, uh, distribute the the product they they produce from locally to nationally, for example. That's the way we we uh, engage the people. Uh, that's the very important is a local hero. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Now we try to open the second round of the dialogue and question. Anyone? If not yet, so I uh, would like to uh, invite Pa Dida. Do you have your uh, perspectives on hearing from the business leaders just presenting? Do you have some comments or do you have some views? You see that uh, the business leaders already in that, okay, at this stage. What's next, the challenge for them, the government? What do you tell, what do you want to tell to the business leaders? The students already raised the questions, okay. <laughs> Will you have uh, uh, enough uh, jobs in the future for the business, yeah? And from the government, what do you expect from the business leaders? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think the role of the private sectors that have shown with from Badak experience and era PP is very, it's very good. Uh, this, they they already shown their commitment uh, to for environment and also climate change. Uh, but for uh, our commi uh, our uh, commitment to reduce emission uh, that. Uh, put in the, our NDC, is it not the job of government? So we have to work together. Yeah. So in the future, we will have uh, built a common framework to work together uh, for achieving our target. This is Indonesia targets, not government targets. So we have to work together. Okay. And I already mentioned in <coughs> my presentation that we already have uh, developing some uh, scheme for the private sector engagement. Uh, and also we have to also uh, work together with the community, with the people, with all stakeholders, uh, uh, hand in hand, uh, reducing emission reduction and also uh, achieving our SDGs. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So it is very important to have the same reference of talking we have now the SDGs and the uh, climate challenge agenda as a, our common reference to talk and to make progress. Okay, thank you, Padida. And so, Thomas, do you see uh, any change soon in the university of the uh, management and technology? Uh, where, 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 where the university is going right now? Could you, could you give a clue? to the business leader and the, to the audience, where yeah. the university is going in this uh, enterprise? Definitely university follow the uh, main challenges. The uh, trying to support with technology and with new ideas. In terms of circular economy, we are looking at the country like Indonesia and we see like uh, two important uh, direction. One, this is energy production, another infrastructure. And we see also that there is no clear symbiosis between these two strong streams, let's say. Okay. Strong currents. That's what we propose to make stronger symbiosis. To see the needs of infrastructure and to see and to see the energy sector in real way, not dreaming, not blaming, just to be real. Energy sector of Indonesia will based on coal many, many decades. And in this case, the result, they are different kind of anthropogenic minerals, and there is two options, to stockpile or to use. University support with clear ideas, standardization, environmental support, technology, hopefully also guiding how to find the finance. Okay. Not necessary finance inside Indonesia, maybe outside, maybe for the climate savings, maybe for the sustainable development. In this case, university can come 
with whole European experience, with, with connection with the business, but definitely the minimum setup is needed, like invitation from Indonesia, like some kind of suggestion that we are open for this vision, and we can help, I am certain. Okay, thank you. And I see that is of relevant to the other country situation, right? Yeah, each country has its own challenge, Indonesia has its own challenge. Okay, so you have uh, Pak Dida as the uh, coordinating ministry of uh, economic affairs, yeah? Uh, you That's said I would that like to ask to minister. Is uh, the, the openness and is the readiness of the government to make symbiosis between uh, energy and the infrastructure sector? Yeah, now we are uh, government of Indonesia promoting uh, the infrastructure and also the renewable energy. Uh, we have already planned uh, for uh, in uh, target for renewable energy in 2025, and also we are implementing the, uh, more infrastructures uh, in the future for fulfilling and then. I believe uh, that somehow the, the, the all uh, <coughs> development in Indonesia will do the uh, approach for low carbon development. So we yeah, are now doing it, uh, we are working on it, and then we will uh, make a very good plan. So yeah, hopefully we can have a very good symbiosis. Yes, thank you, Professor, for the uh, takeaway message to the Indonesia government and also the business and also as relevant to the other countries. So uh, we'd like to invite you to uh, view this uh, video uh, from the uh, April, yeah? Video ready? The Kampar Peninsula, Sumatra. One of the largest intact peak forests in Southeast Asia. This is a critical ecosystem that breathes life and water into the surrounding landscape. In the 21st century, nature needs help to survive. Our biggest threats are illegal logging, unwanted land claims or encroachment, and if that happens, then fire. That's where Restorasi Ecosystem Riau comes in. A dedicated team of rangers, scientists, and forest managers. Their mission? restore 150,000 hectares of degraded peatland, an area the size of London, and protect the forest from misuse. Jangan sampai ada kebakaran. Paling penting di area kita adalah jangan sampai ada api. Setiap hari sampai habis, bagaimana besok? Oh, ini enggak mau ada. The rangers of RER work in partnership with the fishermen and community that call this home. And slowly, the forest is revealing its secrets. You look at this, this is a claw mark of sunbear. This triangular shape, perhaps this bear is trying to get into the fruit. Rare and endangered species adapt to this remarkable world. Restorasi Ecosystem Real is a high-stakes commitment to save a forest. If we weren't here, this place would be under attack. It would be degrading fast. But because we're here... Hey! Ranger, Ranger! It's not. This is Frontier Sumatra. Okay. So, uh, now I'd like to wrap up this session and so I'd like to offer this uh, summary of our discussion today in this session that the government of Indonesia
Indonesia has provided greater support and avenue for business going for sustainability and climate actions. And the concept of circular economy, an example of circular economy implementation in coal and mineral waste utilization is introduced and more technology support will come to help government and business to advance in climate and sustainability agenda. You see that the business has laid the groundwork in improving their performance at the operational level, building adaptive business strategy in international market with sustainability, with sustainability agenda, and collaborating with the government, civil society, and local communities in development work beyond CSR and charity approach. This is now also communicate its policy, operation, and targets within SDGs and climate change context, including at investors and board of directors meetings and external communication. And so next agenda is to invest in knowledge, in technology, and human resource capacity, mainly from the society. And we'll see you in the next uh, session. And we let the business and the non-state actor to continue the good work and we uh, will uh, achieve a better uh, uh, performance in this sustainability and climate challenge agenda. With this, we'd like to close this session with a big thanks to all the speakers <laughs> and to you, the audience and Papillion Indonesia. Thank you so much, good day, and see you in the next uh, session of Indonesia Papillion. Thank you very much, uh, Bapak Nur Adi Wardoyo and all the speakers. Uh, there will be the giving of token of appreciation that will be given by Bapak Nur Adi Wardoyo on behalf of Ministry of Environment and Forestry. And there will also souvenirs to all the yeah to the speakers. And afterwards, please join the photo session. Therefore, we'd like to request the speakers and moderator to be on the center of the stage. That was a very fascinating session. Please give round of applause to all the speakers and moderator for the session. Thank you very much. And next, we still have another session with a title of For Forest and Land Fire Insurance in Asian Region. So everyone would like to recommend you to please stay on your seat and we'll begin the next session shortly. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we will begin the next session shortly with the title of Forest and Land Fires Occurrence in Asian Region. So everyone who is uh, still on the outside of Indonesia Pavilion, we would like to invite you to come inside our pavilion and please have a seat and make yourself comfortable. Thank you.